Uh, what I want to discuss here, that's the outline of what I'm doing here, critical comments on Sakhalin. The first question is what is induction? I mean, is that really induction, what's happening there? Then Sakhalin's use of induction, um, yeah, and that will be enough for as critical comments because, I mean, it hinges all on induction. He says it's an inductive step from the models to the real world. Okay, what is induction? And uh, we talked about the problem of induction already, but I want to go now into somewhat more detail that's also useful in general that you better know, better understand what induction is. First, for contrast, what is deduction? This is what you're all familiar with. Uh, deduction, the example, and that example is uh, 2,500 years old. Socrates is a human being. All human beings are mortal. Uh, therefore, Socrates is mortal. So this is one of these deductive inferences, um, and they have um, the, the property that deduction is compelling. Right? The conclusion is necessarily true if the premises are true. So if you buy into the premises, you have to buy into the conclusion. That's, that's the idea. I, I coined the term, it's a, it's a truth transfer. Right? The truth of the premises is somehow transferred to the, to the uh, uh, conclusion. Uh, there's no guarantee or anything or assumption of the truth of the premise. It only says, if the premises are true, if you happen to b believe the premises, then you must uh, uh, also believe uh, the conclusion. So it's an if-then uh, connection. Right? That's very important. So it says nothing about truth uh, categorically. It just says, if... It's conditional, right? If the premises are true, then you can't evade uh, the conclusion. But then you can't, really can't evade it's necessarily true. So that's the, the, uh, the power of logic or the power of mathematics, if you wish. This is exactly what mathematics is all about, about logical deduction. <coughs> okay, so that's deduction. Now, what's the difference to induction? Here's an example of an inductive step. Uh, piece one of copper conducts electricity, piece two of copper conducts electricity, piece three of copper conducts electricity, etc. So you have how many ever, uh, find a number. And therefore, it's now the inductive step. All pieces of copper conduct electricity. There are two little variants. I'm not going into details. You can say the next piece of copper will conduct electricity, or you may say, all pieces of copper conduct electricity. Both of these are two variants of the inductive step. The point is simply, you, you have a, a, a set of examples here, and then you go outside of that sub set, either to the full set of all possibilities or just to the next one. And the point is inductive, and that means the, the inductive, in contrast to deduction, the inductive step is risky because it generalizes from a finite number of cases to all cases. Risky meaning you may be wrong, yes? In mathematics? Yeah. Well, um, in mathematics, uh, it's the inductive assumption. It's always assumption. You assume, you, you prove for n equal 1, then you assume if it holds for n, then it holds also for n plus 1, and then you use the inductive assumption to prove that it's true for everything. Right? That's a very that's a difference, and and uh, therefore you have to build that in into the axiom. So, for instance, you have to the inductive assumption uh, you have to build into the axioms. You don't get it for free, right? So it just says only if you, it, it's there. The inductive assumption itself is a logical assumption. If you have n, then it holds for n plus one, right? Logically, necessarily, and then you get because you can accept it, then apply that to case number one. Then you get two from two to three, and so on. Then you get the whole set of natural numbers, right? So uh, this is very different. Well, it has some parallel, but uh, it's very different, really. So he, and and it's uh, it's foolproof. It's a real proof. Um, uh, unless you are critic about certain things in infinity, but uh, usually most practically all mathematicians accept that, the inductive proof for, finite, for, for infinite innumerable sets. All right. So, so th this is uh, therefore deductive. It's a special kind of deductive uh, proof in mathematics. And uh, here it's so induction in, in that sense as it's used in the empirical cases. Um, and not, uh, what is it called, vollständige uh, induction, complete induction. I don't know the English term really for that. And, and 
but uh, that's it is. Uh, all right. So the inductive step in, in these cases, like in copper, is risky because it generalizes from a finite number to all cases or even to the next number. And this is not absolutely compelling. You could be wrong, right? It, it's not compelling. Whereas in the, in the Socrates case, uh, being mortal, it's absolutely compelling. No way out. I mean, if all men are mortal, then Socrates is mortal, period. And uh, therefore, inductive inference is ampliative. This is a very important term that you might uh, remember. The conclusion starts more than the premises. In the deductive case, everything you know is in the premises, and you suck that somehow out and get it into the conclusion. And the conclusion doesn't tell you anything new in some sense, right? Everything you know is already in the premises, and you just transform that into the sentence of the conclusion, and therefore it's compelling. You don't add anything. Whereas in induction, you add something, right? You say more. You find it plausible, but you say more. It's ampliative. And that's the risky part of it, because it's ampliative, right? You could be wrong. Right? You could, and yeah, you could be wrong for whatever reasons. The conclusion starts more than the premises, and therefore the premises don't give you a guarantee. In the deductive case, the, uh, the premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion if the premises themselves are true. And that does not hold in induction. And therefore, induction is risky. Right? <clears throat> and therefore, it's so much more complicated than deduction. Um, and you've, um, I remember, uh, you remember, distinguish the two different problems of induction, the philosopher's problems. And uh, the uh, uh, philosopher's problem of induction is if the, if the inductive step is plausible, so the copper case, then the philosophers ask, what is the justification of the inductive step? Right? You take those cases which you believe in, right? and then you ask, why are we so confident? What's the reason? You're not saying, no, I don't believe it. No, no, no. As a, you, the philosophers ask, yes, induction is everywhere. We do it. Even worms do it. I mean, it's deep in biology, by the way. Even if, if you look at, if you have a dog or something, I mean, dogs are able to, to in, inductively generalize from one or two cases. Right? You have a dog and you work in the kitchen and then something falls down and the dog discovers it, whoop, 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 and next day you go into the kitchen and then the dog comes and looks where something falls down. Right? Induction from one or two cases, immediately. And, and re even worms can do it. Right? It's very funny. Induction is deep in our biological setup. It seems to work fun fun fantastically. If it wouldn't, all those animals who use induction wouldn't be here, including us. Right? If that was a very bad step, doing inductive generalization, well, you're eliminated sooner or later, unless there's nothing better uh, at all. Anyway, so uh, the philosopher's problem is whenever induction works, you still ask, why does it work? Can, can I justify it? Can I understand that working? And uh, many philosophers believe that this problem of induction is unsolvable. That has been the, the general consensus, uh, more, no, not general consensus, that's wrong, uh, but, but many people, at least in the last 200, 100 years or so, believe it's unsolvable. There's recently, recently a, a colleague of mine, he says, no, um, problem of induction, solved. You can find it in the internet. <coughs> I haven't studied it, how he does it, it's complicated. Anyway, the scientist's problem of induction is different. Scientists don't doubt the possibility of induction. They say, yeah, induction is possible. But not always. The problem is, distinguish the cases in which induction works from those in which it doesn't work. That's the point. Right? They don't care. If it works, scientists say, fine, let's go use it. Wonderful. Whereas the philosophers say, oh, wait a minute, yeah, it works, that's fine. But how, why do we understand that? Can we justify it? Blah, blah, blah. And then, then they, they uh, uh, have their uh, reflections on that. So the scientists have a different problem and distinguish, uh, distinguish the cases in which induction works from those in which it doesn't work. And here is an example uh, for where it works. Ten pieces of copper conduct electricity, and then the inductive step is all pieces of copper conduct electricity. Right? You still may be wrong, but it seems to work there. Right? People rely on that, and uh, if you wouldn't rely on it, you wouldn't use your iPhone. Or even if you are of a different race, so to speak, your Android, right? Anyway, so because there's copper in it and gold, contacts, electricity, blah, blah, blah. You may not know that, but uh, I, I tell you. Okay, so um, that's an inductive step. 
which you rely on and say, yes, fine, versus 10 coins in my pocket are made of copper. And there you conclude then all coins in my pocket are made of copper. Right? Or handbag. But I don't want to get into gender problems here. All right. So um, you have these 10 points that they are there, and then 10 of them are, are made of copper, and then you generalize that all these pieces are made of copper. And the difference between the two cases is, of course, that, well, roughly speaking, it's a natural law that copper conducts electricity. And once you hit upon a natural law in a few cases, you can generalize to all cases. Right? You just got to recognize, ah, that's a case of a natural law. Oh, yeah, then, okay, then we can generalize. Fine, wonderful. You can still be wrong, but, but that's the basic mechanism. Whereas the regularity of the first 10 coins is purely accidental in your pocket, right, when they are all made of copper. There is nothing, so to speak, behind that fact, and therefore you cannot generalize. Right? The same when, when you play roulette and it's 10 times black. You can't generalize, oh, wow, it's always black now, right? The next one is black again. No. It's a Markov process. It's completely independent what happens at n plus 1, right? Nothing. It just doesn't tell you anything, right? So you've got to be careful when you see some irregularity. Am I allowed to generalize that to more cases? And that's the problem of the scientist, right? The scientist is not, they say, well, let the philosophers talk about this general problem of induction. We don't care. We use it. Because we want to find out something about the world, we use induction, and then, then we, we don't reflect what's the deepest reason why it works. So that's the main point. You've got to distinguish these cases where somehow like a natural law behind that, and then induction works, from those cases where you have a random regularity, right? It, it's still it's a regularity, but it's still random, and you can't generalize from that regularity. So... Now, the problem, of course, for the scientist is how does one know whether in a given case there is something like a natural law behind a given regularity making an inductive step work? So what, what do you do? How do you do that? And that's, of course, a very important question for the scientists. And, of course, in social science especially, you have that situation again and again. You have a certain regularity, and then you say, is that accidental or is that somehow lawful? Right? Is that some, something behind that that produces this regularity? And you, you've got to make decisions there and make investigations. So this is very important for the sciences. Uh, all right. Now... <clears throat> If natural laws are behind it, let's alone whether something similar and like natural laws exist in the social sciences, complicated question, probably not, but anyway, careful. Natural laws always speak about one particular kind of objects. This is an observation. When you look, well, when, when the natural sciences speak about natural laws, they speak about one particular kind of objects. For instance, the pieces of copper, when you talk about electricity, or when you speak about gravitation, or the masses, or you speak about the law of falling bodies that we used um, following um, our friend uh, Milton Friedman, falling bodies, then you have the law of uh, falling bottles on the, uh, bodies on the earth, um, uh, bottles as well, yes, um, and you can generalize you know, to other objects objects, chemical substance, etc., etc., and you have the feeling, well, we have the same kind of objects, and because of the sameness in kind, therefore we have this regularity, because the sameness of kind produces somehow the regularity, right? This is, this is the idea behind it. And this is um, sometimes expressed not in the natural sciences, but in, in philosophy of science, or in general philosophy, it's expressed that natural laws hold for natural kinds, Right? The fact that something obeys a natural law means that the objects form a natural kind, right? like all pieces of copper. They're all copper pieces. Yes, they form a natural kind, and because of that naturality of that kind, namely all the elements, all the copper, pie copper pieces, um, therefore all of them uh, uh, conduct electricity. It's natural kinds. Yeah, the idea is this, if objects form a natural kind, they do so by their very nature, therefore natural kind. They have a certain nature that, that what makes a, a, pop, a copper piece um, a copper piece. That's the nature of that copper piece somehow, the nature of copper. Right? That somehow every, every piece of copper has that sort of nature. That's an idea that we have. Um, 
and they are fundamentally the same, and therefore they obey the same natural law. Of course, they all have also differences. The form of the size of the copper piece are very different. But because of being of copper, they have some sort of common nature. And that common nature, namely being of copper, makes them all conduct electricity, because it's a fundamental property of copper. Right to conduct electricity, and therefore all they have that, and that is a, a copper necessarily has that because it's copper, and there's a natural law somehow that copper does that, and one can understand that if you look at the electrons uh, that form the copper uh, metal piece. <clears throat> okay, they are fundamentally the same, and therefore they obey the same natural laws, and therefore we can inductively generalize within a natural kind. So once you have a natural kind, say if you identify, oh. All the copper pieces, that's a natural kind. Then you can say, you can form certain things you can generalize from having investigated 10 of them than to the rest of them, right? Like conducting electricity or being shiny, for instance. It's also such a, such a property. <clears throat> so if you believe that all copper pieces conduct electricity, you have assumed that all pieces of copper or of metal form a natural kind. Also, all pieces of metal form a natural kind. They all also conduct electricity, among other things. They're all shiny, certain properties. Um, okay, so this idea of natural kind is behind that idea of uh, inductive generalization. That does not solve the problem of induction that the philosophers have, but it shows you a way of describing the situation that the scientist is in, namely, in order to be able to to, to inductively generalize, you must identify natural kinds. And you must have some sort of argument for something being a natural kind, right? That these things all form one natural kind, and then within that natural kind, you can then inductively generalize, it, if you know that. Okay. So if you believe all swans are white, you believe that white swans, swans form a natural kind, which they do not. Right? People believe that because, as you may know, there are black swans, mostly in Australia now, also on the Limmat, sometimes at least uh, some years ago. Anyway, so you've got to be very careful. You've seen many, many swans, right, everywhere where you go. I mean, if, if you go even out to Titicon, which is very far away from here in a sense, right? And if your horizon is just Zurich and Titicon and uh, perhaps even uh, whatever, Embrach. And, and you always see white swans, then you say, yeah, they form a natural kind, right? All swans are white, and therefore there's a natural law. And then, of course, you are really surprised when you see a black swan and say, oops, that was wrong. Okay, therefore, you know, inductively generalizing is, is more or less the same as assuming a natural kind. And you may be wrong there in both cases. <coughs> and therefore, Sakten rightly speaks in this context of some relevant or salient respect in which x1 to xn are similar, right? In order to make this inductive step, right? You've got to identify it, and this is what he means. What he means is something relevant or salient uh, in which uh, respect these axes are similar or some significant similarity as a basis of induction. He's right there, right? You've got to identify you have these different pieces, and then you say, oh, they all conduct electricity. Interesting. Oh, they are all made of copper. So that's the salient uh, property, that's relevant, being of copper is it, that makes them all conduct electricity. And he's right there, that if for inductive uh, inferences, you must identify something similar, something significant, um, as a basis of induction. The significant similarity means, in now uh, expressed in the, the, uh, with natural kinds, it's indicative of a natural kinds, licensing inductive generalization. Well, you, you just look at the stuff and then you see, oh, they're similar in that respect. Yes, that's an essential aspect of these things, and therefore I'm able to inductively generalize uh, within that uh, group then of things. And uh, just to give you the contrast, the set of coins in my pocket is not a natural kind. Uh, it's an accidental set. Right? If I have some, pick, uh, pocket, some, some coins in my pocket, they came in there, and then you know, they have some meaning. If I take out the first ten, they're all of copper. There's no way to generalize that even the eleventh one is made of copper. Right? If they accidentally just in this, they don't form a natural kind. There's nothing behind them you know, that binds them, in a sense, together, that they all have essent some essential property that makes them similar to each other, such that you can generalize. That doesn't work for these um, accidental sets, accidental aggregations. Okay, so far it's clear, so, so Sakten does have this idea, 
that uh, in order to have a basis for inductive generalization, you have to find something that gives you the confidence that the set of objects really forms a natural kind. You, mu you must discover something essential to the objects that you know, binds them together, makes them all similar, and once you found that, then you can say, okay, I look at a subset of that, and then I can generalize to the rest. Because they all, all form a natural kind, which means they have something essential uh, they have some, something essential in common, which licenses the inductive generalization. So that looks good, doesn't it? <laughs>